Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Soldiers Memorial Challenge Chat. My name is Marvin Alonzo Greer, and uh, we are about to begin. I'm going to advance to this next slide real quick. So we're so grateful that all of you could be uh, part of this amazing presentation today, uh, Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion, uh, presented by Jared Frederick. But before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Beelman Truck Company, who allows for these amazing presentations to take place. Before we begin, I would like to kind of put into context uh, the, uh, the presentation today and, um, and acknowledge the historical legacy of our World War I, or sorry, our World War II veterans uh, through today. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. When America entered World War I, sorry, World War II in 1941, most Americans were not fighting to save uh, the European Jewish community and other minorities being persecuted by fascists and the Nazis. Rather, they fought to preserve democracy and carry the American flag that stands for freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. As we reflect on the ideals of these intrepid men and women who fought so hard and stood in, uh, let us stand in solidarity with those on the front lines uh, protect, uh, protesting police brutality today across our country. As St. Louisans, we understand the pain of our brothers and sisters are experiencing in Minneapolis. As we, ex as we experience the loss of our own St. Louis and Michael Brown a number of years ago, and whether it's fighting fascism overseas or white supremacy at home, we must understand as a community that these champions of justice, both on the battlefields and the home front, are fighting for American ideals of prosperity, of freedom of speech, of freedom of press, of freedom of religion, and freedom to live. And we must understand that Black Lives Matter. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Jared, Nichol uh, Jared Frederick for his amazing pr uh, program, Dispatches of D-Day. Jared. Thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's wonderful to be with you all in St. Louis today, albeit digitally. And uh, I'm really glad to be here with you all as we are on the eve of the 76th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. And so I'd like to share some perspectives on the years of research that I did about this momentous event. And as I was researching and writing my book, Dispatches of D-Day, many people often asked me, what could you possibly write that is new or fresh about this momentous event of history? And as I found out, there was quite a lot. In its opening phases, there were about 160,000 Allied service members who participated in what became known as Operation Overlord. And every single one of them had a story. Not all of them had the chance to write memoirs or do interviews or be depicted in movies, but nonetheless, every single one of them had a story. And I set out to discover some of those lost stories along the way. And so the question from the outset was, how was I going to do this? And in a strange way, my story begins where for so many it ended. And that's the Normandy American Cemetery in Colville, sur Mer, overlooking the shores of Omaha Beach. And in this cemetery, there are approximately 9,400 Americans. And I first visited there in March of 2013. And it was a very cold and dreary day. It was the final day of my trip before I departed back to the United States. And as I was walking the grounds of the cemetery, I realized that I was completely by myself. There was nobody else in the cemetery as far as the eye could see. It was just me and it was just them. 
And what made this an even more surreal experience was the fact that it was 20 years to the day that my grandfather, a D-Day veteran who fought on Utah Beach, had passed away. It was 20 years to the day. He died when I was only five years old, and it, it's really been one of the great regrets of my life that I never had the chance to talk with him more in depth about his experiences. But it was at this moment that I realized how lucky I was because he lived 49 years longer than all of the people I was standing before here in the cemetery. And so this was yet another instance where I was motivated to dig a little bit deeper, find some of these stories of individuals who were otherwise overlooked by history. In other ways, this is a story about Americans at home and particularly how citizens on the home front perceived the war as it was happening in real time. And this is where newspapers played a very significant role in my scholarly understandings of what the Normandy invasion was. Uh, and so here before us is the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, June 6th, 1944. And the front page of your city newspaper looked very much the same as front pages of newspapers all throughout the country. And through the miracles of the internet and so many newspapers being digitized these days, I was able to conduct this research in a very in-depth manner. And ultimately I went through 150 different American newspapers. I transcribed approximately a half a million words of newspaper reports and letters that were chronicling the Normandy invasion. And these firsthand accounts written in real time became the foundation for my research. So it, it offers a, a little bit of perspective, a little bit of a benefit. The fog of war hasn't quite settled in as of yet. These perspectives are, are fresh, they're vivid, they're visceral, and by and large, they're an untapped resource on the part of historians. Um, and so this is truly where my journey began. One of the primary newspapers that I used quite frequently um, is a publication that is still in print to this day, and that is Stars and Stripes, the US military newspaper that is still widely read. And uh, there is a, a singular quote that I found uh, from 1944 in this newspaper. And the newspaper itself was speaking to its soldierly readers. And the periodical said, the quest to self-educate will in itself make you a better informed soldier, a better educated American. And in the days ahead, when it becomes your job to help decide issues on which the future all depends, your knowledge of the big picture will make you a better citizen and in a small way that will help make this a better world. And so this illustrates a number of important things, the importance of the access to literacy, of being well informed, of the freedom of the press, the First Amendment. These were crucial elements that American soldiers perceived as one of the hallmarks of why they were fighting the war in the first place. They were of the mind, what do tyrants do? They go after the press. Therefore, we need to protect the press. That's one of the reasons why we are fighting this conflict. And that was certainly something that was in mind as Americans were preparing for this massive invasion across the English Channel. In these months immediately preceding the invasion, uh, the British de described this influx of American and allied personnel into their country as the friendly invasion. And uh, indeed, sometimes matters became perhaps a little bit too friendly, um, as we can see in this uh, photograph here in the background. Uh, we see uh, an American service member uh, fraternizing with uh, some female members of the Royal Air Force. And in these days of, of rationing and shortcomings in wartime Great Britain, uh, things like Hershey chocolate bars, Lucky Strike cigarettes, Wrigley's spearmint gum, silk stockings, 
all of these things carried their weight in gold. They were commodities of the truest value. Uh, and so sometimes Americans used these objects to endear themselves to the British. Um, and indeed, perhaps they were a little bit too vigorous in that regard, um, because in the months before and after the Normandy invasion, uh, there were about 20,000 Anglo-American babies born. Um, and so uh, we, we see this population boom uh, happening on that level as well. Uh, but one of the young reporters who was witnessing these sorts of lifestyles and writing of invasion preparation um, was this gentleman over here on the left. And that is Andy Rooney of future 60 Minutes fame, who was a staff writer for Stars and Stripes. Um, and so this was the beginning of people's careers as well. And whether we look at Andy Rooney or Walter Cronkite, uh, this story of the Normandy invasion would be one of the biggest stories of their careers. And so there is a fair degree of unity of togetherness uh, in Britain prior to the invasion. Uh, but there are also some shortcomings in this regard as well, because it is important for us to remember three quarters of a century onward that in 1944, the United States military is still segregated. And many African Americans in the service, as well as civil rights advocates on the home front, initiated what became known as the Double V Campaign. Uh, and that stood for victory overseas, victory at home. That is to say, if the million plus uh, African American men and women in uniform uh, proved themselves, uh, in this conflict, that that would lay a foundation for civil rights when they got home. Uh, but things were very tense in these days before the invasion in the United Kingdom because the UK had no color line. There was no Jim Crow uh, that was uh, existent in Great Britain. And sadly enough, some black soldiers felt that they had more freedom and liberty in a foreign country than what they did in their own nation. Uh, and as one sergeant recalled many years later, we black troops went overseas to fight the Germans, but we had to fight the Yanks first. Uh, so there are limitations to these democratic notions that Americans were fighting for at this time. And that is certainly apparent in regard to the racial dynamics in the pre-invasion army. Now, when we talk about the invasion, and when we think about when does the invasion begin, if you were to ask a member of the US 8th Air Force when the invasion began, they would have said 1942, because that is when they started bombing German cities, and that is when they started bombarding various military installations in Nazi-occupied France. And these airmen went through growing conditions of flying you know, uncompressed planes at 50,000 feet, and they would ultimately lose more men in the skies over Europe than what the, uh, the Marine Corps did in the entire Pacific War. Uh, but Hap Arnold, the Air Corps chief, he was very adamant on this starting point to reporters. And as he said, we are invading and not at some remote beachhead. We are hitting the enemy where he lives. He knows if he cannot stop us, he's licked. And so we see this, this form of a war of attrition uh, happening here on a broad uh, scale. And uh, the allies were of the mind that we are going to win this through sheer quality. We have more men, we have more supplies, we have a great industrial power. That is ultimately how we are going to win this conflict. Total war in its truest form. And the whole logistical process of the, this preparation momentum is, in my mind, best exhibited through this photograph that we see here. This was taken at a harbor in Devon, England, five days before the invasion. And here we see a whole litany of vehicles stockpiles of equipment and in the background one of the unsung workhorses 
of the Allied war effort known as the LST or the landing ship tank, uh, which had uh, hatch doors at the bow of the ship so it could literally take supplies from ship to shore. And as one reporter was witnessing all of this, they said that it was like a mechanical Niagara. That, you know, if envisioned Niagara Falls and instead of water, picture th this unending flow of men and equipment and, and material and crates and everything imaginable necessary for this massive process. And he said it was unlike anything that he had ever seen before and humanity would probably never see anything quite like it again. And so this offers us a perfect snapshot of those mobilization efforts in those tense days in the countdown to June 6th, 1944. The man who was responsible for this massive undertaking had never once led men into combat. And I speak of General Dwight David Eisenhower. His skills were grounded in planning, cooperation, diplomacy, and logistics. And as Eisenhower once said, plans mean nothing, planning means everything. And he puts those skills to very excellent use here uh, in the first half of 1944, as well as beyond. He had the ability to bring people of disparate views and outlooks and nationalities together and unite them under a common cause. Uh, he is a mediator, and he uses those same skills later on in the 1950s as president of the United States. Nonetheless, though, orchestrating this major effort uh, takes a huge toll on him. Uh, he smokes four or five packs of cigarettes a day. One reporter said that it seemed like each one of the stars on his shoulder weighed a ton. This, this was the weight of command being placed upon him. It was a glorious burden. And as reporter Ann O'Hare McCormick of the New York Times said of Eisenhower and his generals, never has the fate of so many depended on the judgment of so few. The day before the invasion, Eisenhower drafts up this letter that we can see coming up here on the screen. And in it, he takes full responsibility for the failure of Operation Overlord. He was planning for every possibility, including the unthinkable possibility of failure. And this is what leadership is. A person who was willing to take credit for defeats as well as successes. And luckily for he, his soldiers, and us all these years later, the how Operation Overlord plays out renders this letter unnecessary. What I think is so revealing about this letter, which is today in the National Archives, is how he dates the letter. He dates it July 5th, not June 5th, July 5th. The strain on Eisenhower is so great that he puts the wrong month on this letter. It gives us a very brief glimpse into his psychology of the moment and the, the undue pressures that were placed upon him at this very desperate hour of history. But on June 5th, 1944, tens of thousands of Allied service members began to mobilize. And of course, there were many folks from St. Louis who were among them. And one of them is this gentleman right here, Preston Badgett, who was in the 149th Engineer Combat Battalion, who would be going in in the earliest moments of the invasion to clear enemy obstacles with uh, explosives and with vehicles. And uh, his materials are available online through the Library of Congress. I welcome you to uh, go and explore those and you can actually trace his journey. Uh, but he distinctly remembered this moment of when the dominoes began to fall and this huge endeavor was set into motion, what Eisenhower called the Great Crusade. 
And Bagent said, once we shoved off, we were read a little message by General Eisenhower. We were all very tense. We wondered what was in store for us. It was to be our first taste of combat. And for this young man from St. Louis, it was going to be his first but not his last taste of combat. Uh, luckily, he did survive the war. And following the conflict, he became an art designer for the St. Louis Dispatch. He passed away a few years ago, uh, but you can find out more about his story via the Library of Congress. And a fascinating story it is indeed. My book is not about strategy. It is not necessarily about tactics. It's not about command decisions. Rather, it's about people, common everyday people, many of whom we've never heard of before. All that said, there is one single map in my book in order to offer us the big picture. And just as a recap or a, a refresher for some of you who are watching, here is how it's all going to play out on June 6th. There are five main beachheads on a stretch of sand that uh, uh, stretches about 60 miles wide uh, in length. Uh, the two westernmost of the beaches will be designated for American landing zones. And uh, going from west to east, we have Utah and Omaha. Uh, going a little bit further eastward, we have two British beaches, Gold and Sword, and they bookend a Canadian sector codenamed Juno. And ultimately, the landings occur at the place where the Germans least expected it, at the widest length of the English Channel. And one reason why this peninsula uh, is such an ideal place to launch this mass endeavor is because of the port of Cherbourg, one of the few deep water ports in all of Europe that can accommodate the flow of naval ships and supplies necessary to facilitate uh, the advance across Europe that will surely follow. So that is the big picture. That is how it is all going to play out here. And the opening phases of this endeavor will happen shortly after midnight on June 6th, where 13,000 paratroopers of multiple nationalities will be dropped behind enemy lines into the darkness, into uncertainty, and their primary mission is to wreak havoc behind the enemy lines, behind the beaches, and to pave the way for the amphibious landings that are set to take place at 6.30 on the dot, H hour. And in the due course of all of this, many combat correspondents are on hand to chronicle some of these stories. And one story that was chronicled was the group of a very colorful platoon of men in the 101st Airborne that was known as the Filthy 13. And these men were very unconventional soldiers. They were somehow able to resist army hierarchy and army authority. They marched to the beat of their own drum, so to speak. And as we can see in this photo, they shaved their heads mohawk style, they put on war paint, they carried brass knuckles and bowie knives, they hadn't bathed since December of 1943 because they wanted to get all gritty and accustomed to living out in the field and living it rough, and uh, these were guys with a bloodlust. They were very anxious to jump in and wreak havoc as such, and as Stars and Stripes accurately attested, pity the poor Nazi who encounters them. And such was the reputation of the Filthy 13 that 13 years later, they would become the basis for the action film, The Dirty Dozen. So there's a, a grain of truth um, in that movie, and it is rooted in the story of the Filthy 13. Offshore, somewhere between five and 6,000 vessels converged and started circling in the English Channel. Uh, to support this effort. And as one naval captain said, one could use all the adjectives such as colossal, magnificent, stupendous, marvelous, greatest, immense, and still not give any idea of the number of men and material being moved. Uh, and this photograph that is in the background 
offers us, you know, just a very small glimpse uh, of this much larger uh, naval and amphibious effort that is taking place. And in connection with this naval component is one of the favorite stories that I found in the midst of my research and writing. And it deals with a British dog named Muffin. Muffin was the mascot of some of these American infantrymen who were going ashore. They smuggled him aboard their boat. They took him aboard the landing craft, and he was, he was seen as a good luck charm. And one of the operators of this landing craft was a sailor from Wyoming whose name was Lawrence Patman. And Patman took notice of this dog, and you know he, he thought it was kind of amusing. And shortly thereafter, the landing craft blew in two. Patman was thrown into the water. Many of the men were killed. Patman tries to swim to some nearby debris, but his hand is swollen to the size of a football. And he thought, this is it. I'm going to die here in the English Channel. I'm going to drown. No one's going to know what happened to me. And then, surprisingly, uh, salvation to him comes at the sound of a bark. Muffin the dog survived the blast. Patman called out the dog's name. The dog paddled over to him. And for the next hour or so, Patman used the dog as an improvised flotation device to keep him above water. And eventually, both he and the dog were pulled out of the English Channel. Patman did lose his hand. It was amputated that day. It could not be salvaged. Uh, but the dog saved his life. And indeed, in cases like this, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, and Patman, you know, he didn't think his story was anything that amazing, though. And he regretted that he could not actually step foot on French soil. And as he later told a reporter, what the hell can I tell my grandchildren? He didn't think that story was anything amazing. I think quite the contrary. I think that's an amazing story indeed. Some of the first troops who went ashore were actually of my grandfather's division, the 4th Infantry Division. And they were among the most successful units on D-Day landing on Utah Beach. Uh, they made very good and strong advances. But ultimately, the men of the 4th Division felt that they were not getting due credit in the press. And as Stars and Stripes later wrote, the boys of the Ivy Division heard that a lot of people were getting credit for the Allied advances in France. That is almost everybody but the 4th. And so here, too, it underlies the importance of newspapers, the importance of journalism. If combat soldiers were doing a good job, they wanted to read about it in newspapers. And even more so, they wanted other people to read about it as well. Another reason, though, perhaps why the landings at Utah Beach are overshadowed is because of what was happening 15 miles up the coast on the beach code name Omaha, where casualties will be 10 times greater than those on Utah. And in these uh, foreground photos, these are two reporters who were there to witness the carnage. Uh, on the right is Don Whitehead of the Associated Press, who said that Omaha Beach was hotter than hell. He said that no matter where a shell landed, someone was going to be hit by it. The masses were all congested on the beachhead. It was absolute chaos. And that chaos was reflected in a series of 11 photographs taken by life photographer Robert Kappa, who we also see pictured here uh, in the foreground on the left. Um, he was a, a Hungarian-born journalist. He spent only about 15 or 20 minutes on Omaha Beach before he decided to head out because it was too hot. Uh, but this photograph in the background is one of the 10 or 11 photographs that he took. And these images became synonymous with the American landings and became deeply ingrained in American consciousness. And I think that they retain that position to this very day. As wounded men started coming back and being picked up and being taken to hospital ships, here is where nurses 
played such an important role, um, as well as female journalists. Uh, among them was Martha Gellhorn that wrote for Collier's Weekly, and she was married to another war correspondent who was even more famous by the name of Ernest Hemingway. And she was aboard one of these hospital ships. Uh, she had to become a stowaway because the, the kind of the male dominated military hierarchy didn't want to let her go. Um, and so she, she stowed away on a hospital ship. And this is what she had to say about that overwhelming emotional scene of these wounded men being treated. She said, it will be hard to tell you of the wounded. There were so many of them. There was no time to talk. There was too much else to do. Uh, and so a very, very heartfelt perspective here that we see from Martha Gellhorn. We see a similar sort of emotion emerge with the writings of Ernie Pyle. And Ernie Pyle had recently been awarded the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he was one of the most read journalists in the United States. And what made his journalism so unique and so meaningful is that he, he wrote in, in first person terms. People were able to connect and resonate with his writings because he didn't write about generals or strategy. He wrote about the common GI Joe. You know, your your young boy from, you know, Nebraska or Wisconsin uh, who was pushed into the thick of all of this. And ultimately, Pyle made it to the beachhead on June 7th as things were being mopped up. And he, he saw scenes very much like the ones that we see here on the screen. And he wrote, on the beach lay expended sufficient men and mechanism for a small war. They were gone forever now, and yet we could afford it. And so once more, that highlights that, that, that sense of attrition, that we're going to win this thing by quantity over quality, perhaps. Uh, but he later goes on in his article to underscore the sense of loss, not through dead bodies on the beach, but by all of the material objects that were left behind. Bibles, toothbrushes, combs, guitars, tennis rackets, shaving kits, mess kits, eyeglasses, diaries and journals with empty pages that would never be filled. Each one of those lost objects was representative of a young man who had been killed or wounded in the advance up this deadly beachhead. And in very eloquent terms, almost Shakespearean terms, Ernie Pyle was able to capture the essence of this sense of loss that so many Americans were feeling, uh, both at home and overseas. Uh, and so that highlights another element of my book, how were people on the home front reacting to word of D-Day? Um, it, was, it was a collective emotional experience. Uh, as I phrase it in the book, it was a fearful jubilation. People were happy that it was here and that it was on, but they were worried about ultimately what it would mean. Victory was not a foregone conclusion. And that was the one thing that was most certain. Uh, but here's a photograph from New York City. Uh, and we can see a sign hanging above a synagogue. And it says this synagogue will be open for 24 hours for services on D-Day. All are welcome. And once more, that underscores that sense of unity and togetherness that was brought about by national tragedy. And here, too, uh, St. Louis comes into the picture. And uh, many of you will undoubtedly recognize this uh, neck of town and what was uh, previously known as the theater district. And I believe it's known as uh, the arts district today in many of these uh, buildings. And I think some of uh, these signs even uh, still stand. Uh, but the St. Louis Post-Dispatch chronicled how people were feeling on June 6, 1944 in St. Louis. And then this photograph here is, in fact, from 1944. And uh, Here's, here's what was said. Uh, 
This means that everyone will have to hit the ball harder than ever. Workers at the Emerson Electric Gun Turret Plant were told at 4 a.m. on the plant's public address system. So they're being told about the invasion as it's happening. We didn't know exactly how they'd take the announcement, a spokesman said, but it appeared that they were very serious about it. Nobody stopped work to do any celebrating. And elsewhere, uh, a spokesman at the Wright plant said, everyone kept right on building airplanes that's what we're here for. And so once again, that sense of dedication, of perseverance, that we're in this thing, we're going to win it, we need to battle out the storm, and we need to push onward. And we can kind of see that, that tenacity, that sort of spirit, uh, taking place not only in Normandy, but in the streets and factories and plants and among the people of St. Louis as well. And I absolutely love this photograph here uh, in the background. What a great color shot of the city in 1944. Um, all that said, in other American cities, not everything was uh, as bound together, we could say. And unfortunately, there were a number of labor strikes going on in the United States at that time. And one of the biggest of them was in Cincinnati. Um, and workers at a Wright Aeronautical plant, several thousand of them went on strike because six African-American employees were hired to work in the metal shop. And this was seen as an outrage on the part of many of the white workers and they went on strike and they delayed in the construction of many airplanes as a result. And rightfully so, the Cincinnati Post called these workers out for doing this. And they said, you right workers, what will you say to the fathers and mothers of those men who fall in France? Um, and so, you know, this is where we see, and this is one of the really surprising things that emerged in my book, uh, where D-Day really becomes a foundation for the civil rights movement that will play out in broader form in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, that we are fighting for freedom overseas. Let's ensure that same freedom on the home front. Some really interesting insight that I gained here in that regard. These issues, though, are far from the minds of <laughs> soldiers on, on the front lines, though, I think we could speculate, um, including paratroopers of the 101st Airborne, who uh, received, uh, many of whom received medals in the streets of Carentan exactly two weeks after D-Day. And what was so interesting about this episode was not the ceremony itself, uh, but what immediately followed, because these troopers were treated to a movie uh, in a YMCA off the town square. And that movie was a comedy, a slapstick comedy by the name of Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble, starring Mickey Rooney. And so there were a thousand paratroopers shoved into this theater. And, you know, they, they were laughing, they were smoking, they were having a good time, and they were kids again even as the, the rumble of cannon could still be heard in the distance. And not only is that poignant, but, you know, the town got its theater back, which is so symbolic of the liberation for the French people that was happening at this time. And perhaps even more poignant is the fact that that movie was the last movie that many of those men ever saw. And so I thought that this was such a, a heartfelt moment um, and, and such a representative moment of what these guys are going through that it was worthy of inclusion in my book. And certainly that sense of loss can be felt all of these years later. And the story of these two twin brothers, Henry and Louis Piper, whose ship, LST-523, that we can see here, uh, hit a mine in the channel about two weeks after D-Day, and both of these brothers were killed. What does that do to a family? How do their parents cope with this? What's it like to lose two sons who were born on the same day, and they end up dying on the same day as well? In death, the brothers' uh, bodies were separated. Um, but thanks to the research of a high schooler, no less, just a few years ago, just in 20, 
2018, Henry and Louis, Louis Piper were reunited at the Normandy American Cemetery, and they were buried by nieces and nephews who had never met them before. And it just goes to show, and, and many of you watching here today undoubtedly have connections with World War II. Maybe it was a dad or an uncle or a neighbor that you knew growing up or one of your bosses you know, earlier in life. We all have a connection to World War II. And 75 years onward, as, as we mark the, the finale of the end of that war, 75 years later, we must ask a very important question. What do we owe the dead? What do we owe these nearly 10,000 Americans buried in the Normandy American Cemetery? And the hundreds of thousands more killed elsewhere, and the millions more who lost their lives globally? What do we owe the dead? Dwight Eisenhower had the perfect answer for that. And he confessed it to reporters the same week as the invasion. And he told those correspondents, our countries fight best when our people are best informed. I should feel disturbed if I thought that I or my public relations staff were held as anything but friends of the press. I will never tell you anything false. Is in Eisenhower's view, one of the best ways to honor those who fought in the Second World War was to be informed, be engaged citizens of the world. This is what Eisenhower called for. And this is what he said was one of the best means of paying tribute to these honored dead of that conflict. And he kept true to those words. And 20 years later, in 1964, Eisenhower returned to Normandy with CBS reporter Walter Cronkite. And as he was standing over that same American cemetery, he admitted to Cronkite, I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think and hope and pray that humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. And that is the great task remaining for us 75 years onward. What are we going to do with that chance that had been granted us three quarters of a century ago? And if anything, I hope you keep that very important point in mind today, this week, as we commemorate the anniversary of D-Day and in all of the days to come. So with that, I thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you're interested in uh, purchasing a copy of my book, Dispatches of D-Day, uh, it can be uh, purchased on Amazon. And uh, if you're uh, would like to ask any questions, we can uh, we can do so now, um, or you can uh, follow me on my Facebook page, and, and we can interact in that manner as well. But thank you for joining me today. It was a real pleasure. Awesome, Jared. Uh, thank you for your awesome presentation. It was very timely that uh, that D Day. This is the anniversary of D Day, and as well as um, the ideas of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, and what's going on today in of an American society. So thank you for that. For those thank of you who would like, um, for those of you who would like to ask questions, um, we uh, Jared will, is available for the next about fifteen minutes. Um, we have uh, to answer some questions for you. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A box. Um, and if you click there, you can type in questions and then I will read those out to Jared uh, so that uh, he can respond to those questions. And as we wait uh, for questions to come in, uh, there was a person you mentioned in your presentation. I know you did a really good job of connecting St. Louisans uh, to your, uh, in this program, uh, but Martha Gellhorn was also a St. Louisan. Um, her mother is buried right here in St. Louis, Edna Gellhorn, um, who was an activist and pushed for um, women's suffrage. Um, and Martha left and uh, I believe she's buried in England now, but yes, she married 
Ernest Hemingway. So we are very proud of Martha Gellhorn and her mother, Edna, and the work that they did uh, promoting uh, human and civil rights, as well as uh, being one of the first women war correspondents. Indeed, indeed. And, and thank you for, uh, for reminding me of that. I, I failed to mention it in my presentation, but uh, St. Louis should be incredibly proud of, uh, of the Gellhorn family. And, uh, you know, Martha Gellhorn, she really struggled with military bureaucracy during World War II. Um, and it, it was because she was a woman and she was looked down upon by the powers that were. And, and she had, you know, some infamous uh, scraps with, uh, with the powers that be. Um, and, and she told one press officer, uh, you know, she, she said flat out, um, it is necessary that I report on this war. I must see for those who can not see themselves. Uh, and uh, sadly enough, one, one of her main antagonists was her own husband, Ernest Hemingway, who worked for the same magazine. And by this point in their marriage, saw her more as a competitor rather than a spouse. Uh, and, and so uh, she had the last laugh, though, because she did get to see the invasion. And to my knowledge, she was the first female correspondent to step on French soil uh, the night of the invasion. Uh, so uh, St. Louis should be really proud of her. And we, and we are. We definitely are. Um, so there's a question that just came in. How did the filthy uh, 13 come together? And just for reference, The Dirty Dozen is one of my favorite movies. My dad showed it to me as a child. So I was very interested in, um, and when you said The Filthy 13, I'd never heard of them. So yeah, yeah do you know how The Filthy uh, 13 came together? That's a great question. And uh, there, there's, for, for anybody who's more interested on The Filthy 13, there's, there's a great memoir uh, written by one of uh, the Filthy 13, who I had the chance of meeting on a few occasions, called Fighting with the Filthy 13. It is quite a lively read. And uh, in essence, um, you know, there was really nothing formal to it. Uh, these guys simply just kind of broke off from their regiment, and they decided that they were going to go out uh, and do their own thing, uh, fight uh, the war in, in the manner that they thought best and that somehow they were able to get away with it. Uh, they pretty much went rogue and went out and lived in the English countryside <laughs> um, for several months uh, prior to the invasion. Um, I'm sure there's a little bit more red tape behind the story than that, uh, but at least that's the story that many of them later conveyed in their lives. Uh, and, you know, they, they tallied up uh, quite the body count. Uh, when they were in Normandy. Uh, you know, it wasn't until a week or so after the invasion uh, that, you know, that superiors even found out, you know, where they were and, you know, what they were doing. I mean, you know, they put tally marks in the stocks of their rifles and, you know, all sorts of, of colorful stuff like that. Um, but somehow, inexplicably, uh, these guys were just able to spurn authority and get away with it. It's, it's, it's an incredible story. They, they just kind of dived off the radar, uh, so to speak. Good question. Uh, so what was the most challenging part of your, uh, what was the most challenging part of your research and kind of chronicling like which newspaper articles you would include and which ones you would not include in your book? That was, in fact, the hardest part of the book, uh, because like I said, I, I transcribed close to a half a million words in newspaper reports. And uh, in many ways, this book started by accident, um, because uh, one day a student of mine uh, brought in a pile of yellowed newspapers that he pulled from the top of a dumpster. Uh, an older neighbor of his had passed away and the kids and grandkids were cleaning house. And uh, this person had been alive during the war and they saved all these newspapers. And even though they didn't mean much to the family, they obviously meant something to the person who originally collected them. And so he brought those into class and presented them to me as a kind of a scavenger prize, if you will. And uh, 
I started going through them and I was just absolutely amazed by the level of detail in them. And I thought this would be a really interesting kind of classroom activity. Uh, going through period newspapers and finding firsthand accounts of the time period. And so I started doing this research with that in mind. Uh, and then I couldn't stop. I, it, I just kept going. Uh, and, and it became like an addiction uh, of sorts. Uh, and and then a half a million words later, I, I figured out that, you know, the story that I have here is worth telling beyond the confines of the classroom. And that's how my book came into being. Uh, and indeed, as, as one of our viewers suggested, it was at times incredibly difficult to determine what to include and what not to include. And uh, indeed, I wrote uh, several chapters. I have several chapters uh, that are not in the book. Uh, and uh, maybe if, if a later edition comes out at a, at a future point, I can uh, do like a director's cut or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I wrote a chapter on the British perspective. I wrote a chapter on Point du Hoc. I wrote a chapter on the air campaign uh, prior to uh, the formal invasion. and. Uh, you know, my publisher thought, you know, this stuff is great, but you need to cut a little bit. <laughs> um, so perhaps at a later point, I can share some of that further research. But that that was the most uh, difficult part of it all. I'm sure, uh, as a as a fellow scholar as well, when I'm writing and having to go through stuff, it's really hard to cut because there's so much good history out there. Indeed. Uh, another excellent question. Uh, this one is mainly pertaining to your location. Uh, because we're all in quarantine right now for the most part. Um, and this person asks, uh, curious, about, uh, curious about the room and backdrop you are presenting from, because it does, it does appear that you are in a war room. Yes, yes. This is a, a, a digital background, and uh, the, it's the, that, that viewer is very astute for asking. Uh, the, the room behind me is uh, the map room at Southwick House. Uh, not too far from Portsmouth, England. And uh, this room behind me uh, was the nerve center of the planning operations for Overlord. And so this was the headquarters for the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. And in the days before we had uh, jumbo screens and computers and, uh, you know, like mission control, uh, they had to do it with pegs and pins. And that is how they mapped and charted the progress of the invasion. And the room today, is, by and large, remains a time capsule. Uh, and it is a, a museum, a historic site, which you can go visit uh, as a tourist. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and I'll mention, too, um, I, I, I am a history professor at Penn State. And so for the past three months, you know, I was teaching online due to the pandemic. And so uh, every day in class, I would have a different background that thematically tied in with the, the content that we were looking at that day. And sometimes I would even dress up too, uh, to uh, uh, liven the circumstances for students. Um, but it's, uh, it's a trend or a, a tactic that, that I carry on with online presentations like this too. And it adds a little bit of, of color uh, to the conversation. So. Thank you for noticing. Oh, I think we all we all love that, um, and it makes it definitely more real, um, and helps it kind of bring everything to life for us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I believe that is the last question, and we will wrap up. So I want to thank you all for joining us today for this amazing uh, presentation. Again, uh, Jared, I'd like to thank you for presenting. Um, it was very informative, and I know I learned a lot, and I'm pretty sure our viewers did as well. I hope I can come in person someday to your fine museum and uh, meet some of you all individually. Oh yes, we would definitely, uh, we'll definitely have you back um, in person once things are a little bit safer for you to travel and leave your, uh, uh, your map room. <laughs> uh, but thank you all for joining us today. If you uh, like the programs that we offer, um, please consider becoming a member. You can see the, the link right here on your screen. Um, as well as at the end of this program, you'll be able to take a brief survey uh, to let us know how we can do better 
and um, what you thought of the program. Again, we want you to uh, we want to thank you all for coming out today and joining us uh, digitally. And uh, check us out in two, uh, in two weeks. Our next program will be on our next challenge chat will be on uh, June uh, June seventeenth at the same time at noon, and it'll be focusing on Ulysses S. Grant and reconstruction. And they'll be offered uh, by Nick Seiko, who is one of the, uh, the park rangers at the U.S. Grant National Historic Site here in St. Louis. Um, so check us out, and we hope you all are having and remain, to have, uh, remain having a safe and productive um, uh, uh, week. Thank you all for coming out today. Have a great day.